everyone. Uh, it's uh, I, of course, can't see you out there, but it's great to have an audience. Great to be able to talk about this very important topic. So we're this is a kickoff event for um, Earth Month here with uh, Cook County. So uh, we're, we're very happy. We have a great panel here. My name is Mark Batoznak. I'm a professor at DePaul University in Environmental Science and Studies, and I've also uh, work on the, the Cook County Environmental Commission. So I have some links that way and I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be your moderator tonight. So we have a, a great lineup and we'll have each of our panelists uh, introduce themselves here right now and because we want to get right into talking about content and talking about um, how important environmental science and studies is here in the Cook County region. So we'll start with our uh, with Commissioner, uh, Commissioner uh, Bridget Degan. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for everybody for spending part of your evening with us. We're so excited to kick off this Earth Month first event on April 1st. It is April Fool's Day, but this is no joke. The environment is very important. And that's why we're committing our time and energy, especially strongly this month, to really focus on the environment and everything we can do. So tonight's event, um, you know, as Mark had uh, noted, is about what individuals can do for the environment. And that's what we'll be talking about. I'm Bridget Degnan. I'm the Cook County Commissioner in the 12th District. Cook County is served by 17 different commissioners. Each one of us has its, our own district that we uh, represent. We represent Cook County as a whole, but I in particular uh, represent much of the north and northwest sides of the city of Chicago. So um, my constituents are number about 330,000 people. Um, a lot of the work that the county does entails work with public safety and public health. So public safety includes our work with the sheriff, uh, the court system and the judiciary um, and uh, the public health component includes the two large hospitals that we operate, which are Stroger and Provident and a network of 16 healthcare clinics. And so personally, this is something, the environment is something that I am very engaged in and um, very much want to support. And so uh, that's my connection to tonight's event. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome and thank you. We're going to next get the introduction from our, uh, this is the Metropolitan Wall, uh, I'm sorry, Water Reclamation District, and it's, commis uh, it's Commissioner Deborah Shore. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Commissioner Deg Degnan. I'm a commissioner too. Uh, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District is the agency that treats sewage. It was founded as the Chicago Sanitary District in 1889 and manages stormwater for pretty much all of Cook County. So it's Chicago and 128 other municipalities. Uh, we have a board of nine commissioners who serve for six year terms and we're elected at large throughout Cook County. So I represent more than 5 million people. I've served on the board since late 2006 when I ran at that time, I was the first person in 20 years to run with any kind of conservation credentials and uh, go figure, right? For the agency that has such a role in managing our fresh water because it manages used water and rainwater. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, I've been an avid volunteer doing habitat restoration in the Cook County Forest Preserves and that really led me on the path to public service. Um, thanks, Mark. I'm delighted to be with all of you this evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deborah, very much. And rounding off our terrific panel here tonight is uh, Deputy Director of the Citizens Utility Board, Sarah Moskowitz. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Degner and, uh, and Deborah and Mark. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. My name, again, is Sarah Moskowitz. I'm the Deputy Director at the Citizens Utility Board, otherwise known as CUB. And CUB is a nonprofit utility watchdog organization that was created in the early 1980s to represent the interests of utility ratepayers. So we approach the issues of clean energy and sustainability from a um, a notably uh, consumer point of view, which very much kind of aligns with environmentalist point of view. So we like to keep things practical and really break things down for how everyday folk 
can um, kind of tap into the clean energy economy and be more sustainable and lessen our uh, reliance up on fossil fuels to uh, heat our homes and light our lights. Terrific. Thank you. Th thank you, Sarah, and thank all three of you. This will be uh, terrific. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So we have some prepared questions that I'm going to pose to the panelists right now. We'll, we'll do that for a bit, but please, if you have questions, you can start putting them in the Q&A right now. We'll keep track of those, and then towards the, the end of our hour, we will get into some citizen questions, but we, we have some great questions, and some and so we're, we're looking forward to hearing the panelists' views. We'll keep, um, for this first question, this will go to everybody because we want to hear a little bit about your background. We'll go through in the same order. But um, first off, we want to know a little bit about how you became interested and involved in environmental advocacy. What brought you into this important topic? And in a little bit further, um, can you tell us about your background in environmental advocacy and your work prior to your current positions? We got a teeny taste of that, I think, in some of your introductions, but we'd like you to carry it a bit further and, and, and really let everyone know, you know, how you got to this position and why, uh, why advocacy is important to you. So, Commissioner Degnan? Thanks, Mark. Um, it's one of the, my favorite subjects is talking about the environment because almost all of us, actually all of us, can do something to really promote um, a reduction of the way that we harm the environment with our everyday activities. So back when I was younger um, in high school, I was not terribly good with math or science. So when I had to select a major in college, I chose environmental engineering for two reasons. The first was because I'm super competitive and I hated being bad at things. So I decided that engineering would really strengthen my math and science background, but I selected the environmental component because I thought it was really important for me to save the world single-handedly. At 18, it sounded like a great idea and something that was totally legitimate. So um, I got into environmental engineering. It was a lot more difficult than I had, I had ever anticipated, but at that point, I was way too stubborn to get out of it. So I stuck with it. I ended up loving it. I ended up being really good at it. And I realized at the end of those four years that while I was taught how to develop new innovative technologies to clean the air, to clean the water, to clean the soil, those technologies were so far afield and so far ahead of all of our law and legislative process that what we really needed to do was to change the laws to bring the laws up to scale with where our technology already was. So if you had a business, you can incorporate all this great clean technology, but you weren't required to. So as we all know, there's a supply demand kind of system in the United States. If you have you know, clothes or a cool new house, there's a supply demand on the consumer side. But when it is a law that is pushing large businesses to be more environmentally friendly, I mean, businesses are not just going to come out and say, hey, I'm going to incorporate hundreds of millions of dollars of new technology across the country out of the goodness of my heart. And that's where we need the leadership at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level to push those laws, to be brave, and to say, I think it's important that we focus on the environment because if we don't, there will be a critical, you know, a critical mass, it, it, an issue with the, like, five to 10 to 15 years from now, and by that time, it might be too late. So after college, I went into the United States Peace Corps and spent two and a half years serving in West Africa in a small country called Mali doing um, natural resource management. Uh, that taught me a lot about you know, the environment and you know, working with my hands and everything from gardening to tree cuttings to soil erosion. Um, you know, and then I got back and I, I spent four years doing environmental engineering. So I was out there with a hard hat and steel toed boots, you know, directing crews of people with backhoes to do dig in halls, leaking underground storage tank removal, removal of petroleum products from the ground. Um, you know, it was dirty, dirty work, but it was physically actually cleaning up the environment. Some of that work included brownfields work, which basically means that you take an area that is moderately to lightly impacted by environmental issues and you clean it up so that it's usable um, land that can be put back into land use. After that, I went to uh, law school and my first job out of law school was working in the Environmental Bureau under Lisa Madigan, where I filed claims against polluters, civil claims against polluters, 
um, in all counties north of I-80. So I did that for several years. Um, I eventually found myself working at the state of Illinois for five years and um, I worked on a program in the medical cannabis program, which is green, I guess, right? And to realize that I needed to think about the next step in my career. And that's when I decided to run for Cook County Commissioner back in 2017. I was sworn in in 2018. And when I was campaigning, one of the things I said is that we really need an advocate on this county board. Because out of 17 of us, there's not one scientist. And if you look at city councils across the country, you look at the federal level of government, you look at the state level of government and all our local governments, we have very few scientists that are in there that can really talk to people in layman's terms and explain to them why this is important. And I'll say one last thing on that is that I think when we look at these articles and we read these articles that come out about all the damage that we as humans are doing to the environment, I think it, so many people just can't digest that information because it's so big and our coping mechanisms push us to the next article that's maybe a little bit easier to read, that's not so difficult and so big. But I really think we need advocates in legislature in order to explain it, to make sure that we're pushing it and that we have um, a cornerstone in this area. And so I've always been very passionate about it um, and that passion continues to today. Well, thank you. That was terrific. I mean, obviously hearing the part about, you know, I, I hear this from students all the time. Oh, I'm not good at math. No, that's just, just go and do it. Uh, um, a, math is important and, and B, there's not this, it's not like you're born with a math gene. That's just not true. So thanks for really, um, uh, uh, pushing that out there. That was really uh, fantastic. So uh, Deborah, uh, same question, really, you know, how you got here, what's in, in you know, what both in, you know, the education and then the passion and, you know, the, both the pathway and then why you think it's important why you're here. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, so I was a, a philosophy and art major classical liberal arts in college and was told that I wrote well and I got several jobs afterward writing for university alumni magazines and then did some freelance writing and a few other things. Um, but I've been a hiker and camper and my best friend had moved to Santa Fe when we were in our teens and I would visit her and we would go backpacking and climbing mountains in Colorado, but I lived in Chicago uh, and uh, I was born here. I grew up in Dallas, but I moved back here in 1982 and it's, I love it. It's the heartland city, the great American uh, city. But uh, I realized I wanted to learn more about nature near where I lived. And uh, somehow this was in the uh, early 1990s, I've learned about a group of volunteers who go into the Cook County Forest Preserves and uh, try to restore the native prairies and the oak woods and the wetlands that still exist. And uh, there's marvelous wild nature interwoven in our great metropolis, harboring globally significant assemblages of plants and animals. And the citizen stewardship movement really got launched in the Chicago region in the late 1970s by volunteers who began to spend their time removing invasive brush, uh, trying to restore the way water flowed, uh, reintroducing fire under carefully contr controlled conditions because many of these places, though they had been set aside and protected from development, were, uh, were languishing and were neglected and were becoming overrun by uh, species from Europe and other places that uh, they were acting like bullies in a classroom and taking over. So uh, I, I, the volunteers usually go out on a Saturday or Sunday morning and work for about three hours. And the work changes through the seasons. You cut brush or pull weeds or collect seeds. And I found that I liked the work and I liked the people. I liked getting to know nature near where I lived. And uh, so I kept going back. 
And uh, it's been said that restoration is a reciprocal act, that in working to restore nature, it restores us, our bodies and our spirits. And I certainly found that to be true. But in the mid 1990s, this work of habitat restoration, which had led to the launch of a regional consortium called Chicago Wilderness of public and private agencies, including the Cook County Forest Preserve District and the Field Museum and the Nature Conservancy and the Park District and neighboring forest preserve and conservation districts uh, seeking to protect and preserve and restore the biological diversity uh, of the region, that work came under a great deal of uh, ill-informed criticism by a Sun-Times columnist and subsequently by uh, Cook County Board President John Stroger, who issued a moratorium shutting down all of the volunteer work. And that led some of us to get more active politically to uh, try to elect more reform-minded people to the Cook County Board and to uh, advocate on a advisory council that was created. I was appointed to that advisory council. We, we founded a group called Friends of the Forest Preserves. And uh, eventually I thought I might want to run for the Cook County Board someday uh, solely because the board has oversight over the forest preserves. And the nugget in, in this is that many people end up running for office because they get angry because something they care about, whether it's education or healthcare or nature uh, is neglected by those charged with its care. And uh, that was one of the reasons I considered running. I went through a candidate training program for democratic women in Illinois, but was biding my time because I happened to be represented by an excellent member of the Cook County Board, one of Commissioner Degnan's colleagues uh, and I was approached in 2005 by two young men who said, would you consider running for the Water Reclamation District? Because uh, they knew of my interest in conservation. Uh, I think they were looking to see more progressive people in different agencies. And I happen to believe water is gonna be the issue in years to come. In many places it already is and somehow felt I might have something to bring to the agency. Uh, so I uh, had this episode of middle-aged arrangement and ran for public office and happy to say I was successful. I'm now in my third term. Well, that was terrific. Uh, thank, thank you so much. And I, you know, so many themes uh, I, and I wanna give you guys all the time, but I think talking about how I love how you started and talking about we, we sometimes think nature is out there, like to, to go see nature, we can't see it. We live in the city, there's no nature around it. That's just absolutely untrue. So that just to appreciate and, and the forest preserves are sort of the crown jewel, but the, the park district and, and everything else are just walking down the street. A lot of streets don't have as many trees as they should, but still there's trees, there's nature everywhere throughout the city. So that's a, a really neat theme. Thank, thank you so much. So um, uh, Sarah, could you give us your origin story? Yeah, sure. Although, uh, Deborah, I'm going to use that middle-aged arrangement. That's my new go-to excuse for, for everything right now. Um, also, I, that was fascinating. I didn't know anything about uh, that history of the, of, of the volunteer programs. I am actually a frog monitor with the uh, forest preserves. Um, so much fun. So, and it's amazing getting out into the Cook County forest preserves that are within Chicago city limits. It's like wilderness. Uh, it's just magical. Um, but back to uh, me, uh, so I, my history is a little different in that I, um, I found myself in the position of kind of advocate, advocating for um, clean energy and sustainable energy practices, kind of through, through the back door, through a more of a, um, a social justice, low income advocacy um, background. So working at Cub was my first job out of college. Uh, at the time, I just wanted to, a job where I would help people, and I got a job working on Cubs Hotline, so I was one of the folks who picked up the phone when people called us with issues with their utility companies, so I would counsel them on what their rights are, what kind of programs exist, and we had contacts at um, 
higher offices at all the utilities that we could go to on folks behalf, as we still do. So if anybody watching has an issue with the utility or knows anybody having an issue with the utility cub still has a great hotline and everyone answering the phone over there is really nice and we just want to help. Um, and it was so long ago that our number one enemy at the time was Ameritech, the uh, landline phone company, which soon thereafter became SBC and then got taken over by AT&T and then got deregulated. Um, so that kind of took us out of the mix. But meanwhile, um, I got to, to participate in and watch um, a series of really good bills pass in Springfield that did things like modernize the grid, make it a lot easier for um, um, people to produce uh, distributed generation, which basically is like rooftop solar. Um, a series of, of, of um, bills passed that really opened up a lot of options for little old residential utility customers like you and me. So suddenly, whereas if someone who was having trouble paying their bills used to come to us and say, hey, this ComEd bill is way too high, there wasn't much we could say other than, you know, try to use less. Um, maybe you should shell out more money for some energy efficient products, but of course there aren't any rebates or anything like that. That was then, this is now, there are rebates available for people who wanna upgrade their homes for more efficient uh, equipment. Um, there are great programs available through the utilities. I can't believe I'm saying this. I've worked at Cub for two decades, but there are actually some good things being done by the utilities to help their customers use less energy. Um, and uh, I think someone mentioned that, that these things don't just come out of the goodness of folks' hearts. It's actually the result of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into getting laws passed in the state that actually require the utilities to meet certain standards when it comes to efficiency and when it comes to renewables. So, um, so it, I kind of just found myself in the middle of all of that, able to connect everyday folks to um, ways to be more efficient, ways to actually get solar. Now we have community solar. I myself live in an apartment. So of course I can't install solar panels on my, my apartment building, but I can buy a share. I can subscribe to a share of a community solar garden somewhere in ComEd territory. And I can get credited directly on my ComEd bill for my share of the electricity that's produced. So in a way I can, I can contribute to the development of renewable energy right here in Northern Illinois, and I can see the benefits of that on my on my bill. And so it's really fun to be in a position where we can connect folks to those kinds of uh, programs um, and also find folks to who, who want to learn more and get more involved. Um, CUB is in the middle of uh, working to try to get better um, clean energy law passed here in Illinois. I think this is probably a 501c3 event for me, so I won't go too far into it, but uh, if you're interested, go on Cub's website, look it up. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's really, and then especially now things like um, energy burden and um, environmental justice issues like that are really getting the attention they've long deserved. And we're especially, um, you know, given kind of the tragedy of the past year, um, we have seen a heightened awareness about some of these really important issues and suddenly, um, you know, it, concepts like energy burden and environmental justice are almost um, just household terms now. And I have friends who always used to roll their eyes when I started talking about what I work, did for a living, now asking me um, about, about what what's going on here in, in our state and um, when it comes to energy burden or when it comes to what happened in Texas, was it really windmills? No, um, we're really kind of at a turning point here and um, where the dots are being connected between um, renewables and everyday folks and affordability and reliability and all that good stuff. And it's really fun to be in the middle of it all. Well, great. Thank you. That was also terrific. And uh, I'm glad you you did. Uh, that's what I was going to go into environmental justice. I like how you made that very explicit link. I think too often, again, in the past, not today, 
we kind of thought as environmentalism here and, and issues of social justice, racism over here, that there yeah, may be a little connection, but no, they're, they're like this. And I think that's a, a really nice message to, to convey. So thanks. Those are, uh, so that's a terrific uh, introduction to our first question. Now we're gonna move on to some more focused questions for each of the panelists. So uh, we'll get right to it with uh, Commissioner Degnan. So here's your prepared question. How do your goals for the Cook County Environmental Commission, and, and yes, full disclosure, I'm on that, uh, intersect with your grassroots work that individuals can do to protect the environment? And carrying that a little bit further, how do your personal individual goals to be an active advocate for the environment align with those of the commission? Thanks, Mark. So as you know, because you are on the commission, I started that an environmental commission is one of my first pieces of legislation that I worked on that I drafted and passed at the Cook County Board. So I, I was pleased to hear Deb Shore talk about her desire to be on the county board to really foster and nurture the forest preserves. There's 70,000 acres of forest preserves in Cook County. And unless people are really looking out for it or they have, uh, you know, staunch advocates in, as they're elected, you know, the, there's, so, there's, so much, there's limited money. And so when you have limited money and you have to decide where to send it, if you don't have a staunch advocate, it will get sent somewhere else. So that's why we have to continue to focus on our environmental goals and in particular, the forest preserve. So um, I'm glad to hear that uh, Deborah Shore, uh, had wanted to be on the county board because we definitely need advocates like you for sure. And Sarah Moskowitz that you are focused on um, the similar type of line of interest. So I started this environmental commission in 2019 and I did it because the first six months I had in office, I went around and talked to like the National Resource Defense Council and as many different environmental advocates as I could find that would talk to me in Chicago. There's great policy, there's great research, there's great documentation. Um, but you know, where I where I found that there was maybe less uh, action items that I, you know, wanted to see was where people took all that great research, took all that great knowledge, and then put it into action, like where the rubber meets the road. And that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be like, people have already done all this work. Why don't we compile it and then just do the work? But it would be an action-driven group of people. So the idea was to bring together nine different environmental experts from different sectors in geographically diverse communities in Cook County to make these concrete environmental changes. So every term there is, uh, we identify three different goals, something that's supposed to be easy, something that's supposed to be medium, and something that's supposed to be difficult. So our 2020 goals were industrial composting, uh, tree planting to increase the urban canopy and amending the Chicago, city of Chicago's weed ordinance. And I'm the chair of that commission, but it's very much a collaborative commission. It wasn't like me deciding these three actionable goals and then telling everybody we had to push them out. Really, we decided them as a group after a lot of discussion and research. Um, we chose composting because for the people that are listening who may not know so much about this, composting really is this process where you have the food waste um, and you transform it into a, like a fertilizer that can enrich soil. It's a delicate process because it, it can be too acidic and you know harmful. So you really want to make sure that there are there are composting companies that will take our food waste in Cook County and know the ins and outs of how to do it and, and make that fertilizer. So composting has a lot of benefits. It reduces methane emissions. It aids in carbon sequestration. It reduces stormwater runoff. Um, you know, when food waste that we have in Cook County is not composted and instead it makes its ways to the landfills, it emits greenhouse gases caused methane, which are, you know, have negative impacts on our environment, not just in Cook County, but further afield. Um, it's, there's economic loss of approximately $680 billion for industrialized countries from food, from agricultural, agricultural production that's not used and wasted. Um, so what we really wanted to do was make sure that large scale, comp, large scale food generators like um, large arenas like the United Center or the hospital, like large hospitals or the jail system, places that produce food waste 
we're diverting their food waste into um, industrial composting sites. One of the things we also realized during this uh, effort was that there are not as many industrial composting sites as we thought there would be. So what we wanna do is drive that front end, drive the people that are producing the waste, and then there'll be a supply kind of demand issue. And hopefully there'll be more companies that are willing then to develop um, industrial composting processes because they know that they'll be able to make money. Um, so I encourage you at home that you can start your own compost pile and you can also subscribe to services that will bring a bin to you. It has a gasket at the top and a buckle so that no rodents can get into it. You put it on your back porch, your front porch, whatever, it gets picked up once or twice a week, um, a month, you know, depending on the service. Um, it does cost money, but it is a great way that you can spend a little bit of money every month to divert your food waste into a composting system. So with our tree planting initiative, um, this was really more for uh, areas that have less of an urban canopy. The north side of Chicago has 70% more trees in some areas than the south and west side. Now we know that when you have trees, you have easier, the, the air quality is better. We talked a little bit about social justice when it comes to environmental issues. Um, and honestly, when you are out in nature, as Deb Shore just talked about, and you're walking around, there's a quietness and a calm that you feel when you're around a lot of greenery. And if there's no trees and no greenery and you feel like your government doesn't care for you as much as that they care for the other people who have a lot more greenery, there's just a, you know, a, a socio emotional connection there that can definitely be helped with the planting of trees. So it sounds basic. Tree planting is not as easy as you might think. It's not just the getting the trees, it's getting them planted, making sure that the species are appropriate for the locations um, and that the root balls on the plant are cared for for up to two years uh, with watering. So it's great when people want to plant trees, but what's not great is when those trees die and then you know, you don't have the people to care for them. So it is really this multifaceted process that it takes more effort than you would think. So I really encourage as it gets warmer, everybody to take up a hobby. You can plant trees uh, in your own backyard. Um, if you live in the city of Chicago, they have to be one of the species that the, the city wants you to plant. Um, but, uh, you know, those, the trees, each tree annually, I think on average, collects about 48 pounds of carbon per year. And over the average life cycle of one of the types of tree species that we have in Chicago, it captures about a ton of carbon over the life cycle of that tree. So they have cooling benefits. That means your house is, you know, your, your energy, your energy's, you're using less energy uh, in the summer and the winter. Um, and it just, it increases property values too. So we're in Cook County, manage the property tax system. So your property taxes, uh, your property value increases up to 19% um, is a documented association with the higher presence of trees. So really there's no reason not to do it. The city um, has a 311 line that you can call if you need a tree planted in the parkway in front of your house, um, or you can connect with one of the local suburban municipalities um, there is a link that I can put in the chat about um, tree preferences in Chicago. And so finally, the Chicago Weed Ordinance has been an issue for people who would like native gardens for many years now. So a long time ago, maybe 30 years ago or so, many municipalities across our country and abroad uh, uh, enacted weed ordinances. And that really gave those municipalities the ability to mow and cut weeds in properties that weren't properly maintained or cared for. Um, you know, number one, to reduce the amount of rodents that were uh, in that area. And number two, so it would make that area look tidy. Um, you know, there was a good intent behind it. Lots of municipalities did it. It was a general policy at the time. But in the last 10 or 15 years or so, there's been an understanding that the green space in the front yard isn't really always the best use of that space. We in Chicago have generally 25 by 125 plots. It's not a ton of space, but the amount of clean and fresh water you use just by watering your grass all summer long could definitely be used in better ways. It costs a lot um, of money to create that fresh water, the pumping, the, and Deb Shore could probably talk about this much more um, than I could. 
Um, but there's chemicals that are involved in that process. There's energy that's used in that process because people want to water their front lawn, which, you know, I get it. It's beautiful, but we really want to encourage people to think about planting native gardens in their front yards. You can have pollinators. Again, it's carbon sequestration focused and, um, uh, and it, it, you know, there's, did I say pollinators? I get so excited about my uh, weed ordinance. So um, that way they do not, uh, stormwater runoff. So they, they soak up more stormwater. So uh, right now though, at the city of Chicago, technically, if you do have one of these native gardens, if those plants are over 10 inches, they are considered weeds and the city can come mow them. And they can give you a 600 to $1,200 ticket. Now that's an issue right? Because it really conflicts with the way that our environmental advocates want to see people using their, um, their active green space. So I'm working with a few aldermen. We are working with a few aldermen to um, change that ordinance to allow the carve out for, to allow for native gardens. As I understand it, you know, we've only been doing this for a year, but I think there's been grassroots activists that have been working on this for about eight years. Um, and so I'm hoping with our conversations with the mayor's office and uh, with all our aldermen that we will uh, be able to squeak that through, uh, hopefully sometime this summer. I've been very encouraged. I've talked to the mayor's office and their environmental advocates. Um, and it seems like that may, might be something they'd be willing to, to connect on. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that really sums up what we're, what the, what we're doing at the Environmental Commission and kind of different ways that people can get engaged and involved. Well, well thank you. And, and again, I'm, I'm part of the commission. It's it's terrific work. And I'll just say, uh, I, I very much appreciate being invited to be part of the commission. We have a great team and uh, it's just, it's, uh, I've met some really uh, neat people with interesting backgrounds. It's an, an ambitious agenda, but we're, we're already making progress, which is just terrific. So uh, we're gonna move on to Commissioner Shore. We, uh, I have the uh, first question for you here is that for those who may not know, can you provide a brief summary of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and the services that the, the district provides? Sure, happy to. Uh, the Water Reclamation District, as I said before, was founded in 1889. It was called the Chicago Sanitary District. And it was born out of an imminent public health crisis because at that time people were dumping all manner of human and animal and industrial waste directly into the Chicago River, which flowed into uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, it's a slow moving sort of prairie river, but it, ha it handled a lot of commerce and uh, people viewed it just as a garbage can. And yet, Lake Michigan then and now is the source of our drinking water. Not a good idea to disperse raw sewage into your drinking water. And people were getting sick from cholera and typhoid and other waterborne diseases. There was no water treatment at that time. The pumping station on Michigan Avenue was there, but it would just pump water from the lake to uh, a few buildings and, and people would put water from the lake in uh, barrels and deliver it. Uh, there was no treatment to kill bacteria. And so the city planners uh, convened a group of people to say, what can we do? And they studied the problem and decided that the, the least expensive uh, solution at that time was to dig a canal between the South Branch of the Chicago River and the Des Plaines River and to build a lock at the mouth of the Chicago River and to essentially reverse the flow of the river away from the lake and to use water from Lake Michigan to flush our sewage downstream. And so they founded this independent entity. It was created by state law with a mission of protecting the drinking water by keeping sewage out of the lake. They began digging the 26 mile sanitary and ship canal. It was completed in January of 1900 when the last barrier was lifted and they reversed the Chicago River. Subsequently, the eight mile long North Shore Channel was 
uh, excavated from what's now Wilmette Harbor to join the North Branch of the Chicago River. Same idea, to use water from the lake to flush people's sewage away from the lake. And then the Cal Sag Channel was completed in 1922. So this system of man-made waterways was really designed to convey sewage away from the lake and to permit commercial barge traffic to move between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River. And uh, for nearly 30 years, uh, we just flushed raw sewage downstream, uh, but it did protect the drinking water and reduce uh, the incidence of waterborne disease. And then by the late 1920s, uh, sewage treatment plants, uh, a more modern sewage treatment was brought over from Europe and the district began building sewage treatment plants, uh, including one that's considered the world's largest, uh, the Stickney plant right off of I-55 uh, near uh, Central Avenue and uh, one, a large one on the south side of Chicago or Calumet plant, the O'Brien plant in Skokie and later three, uh, four smaller plants, three in the northern suburbs and one in Lamont. So now we treat the sewage. We don't flush raw sewage downstream. And in 2004, the agency was given authority for stormwater management. So it really manages two of the three parts of our freshwater ecosystem. It has a billion dollar budget, roughly 1900 employees and uh, expanded its service area over the years to include almost all of Cook County for sewage treatment and all of the county for stormwater management. Um, and, uh, and gradually has been improving and cleaning uh, the water by treating it and killing more of the bacteria in the Chicago waterways where once there were no fish species because the raw sewage would suck up all the oxygen, leaving none for aquatic life. Today, there are more than 70 different fish species found in the Chicago waterways. And even though they were man-made, they've become important uh, sort of vital arteries running through the heart of this great city. And we see with the river walk and uh, more and more as viewed as an amenity and uh, as a kind of second lakefront, people wanting to recreate uh, with kayaks and canoes and paddle boats to fish and perhaps someday even swim in certain parts of the Chicago waterways. Well, that, that was terrific. And you answered the uh, first part of the second question. And, and just to say, uh, talking about the, the history and the current hydrology of the Chicago River and, and, and everything else is one of my favorite lectures as a telling our undergraduates. They've all heard that the Chicago River has been reversed. They don't have any idea what that meant, really, just besides that phrase. So it's really interesting to talk to lifelong Chicagoans and explain what happened. And I'll just one other quick note is that I, uh, we have a water quality lab that we do part as part of one of our required courses. And so we always went to the Chicago River because for many years we could um, reliably get bad water. Uh, and well, no, very fortunately, that water is much cleaner today. And my E. coli test now, oh, you know, we, we still pick up some probably from the geese, but uh, not nearly the levels we picked up seven and eight years ago. So um, it, it's terrific to see the, the just the improvement over that period of time. So thank you very much. Um, maybe just quickly the the uh, I'll combine a little bit uh, uh, how we what we, what people can do um, how individuals can get involved and what community outreach programs the district has sure uh, happy to throw out some ideas uh, and maybe I'll piggyback on a few things that commissioner Degnan said but um, the district because of our pandemic year has created some wonderful virtual tours so that people can sign up and actually be taken down into uh, the deep tunnel, which you can't tour anymore because it's in operation, but we've been constructing a Des Plaines connecting tunnel. And uh, so you, it's a wonderful tour. The next one is April 14th at 10 a.m. 
and uh, my assistant Alfred will throw up links in the chat uh, and one on May 11th at 2 p.m. And I've done one of them and it, they're wonderful. And the district has put up a permanent virtual tour on YouTube so that you can go whenever your schedule permits. Uh, and I highly encourage it. Um, other ways to get involved, the, the uh, district uh, partners every year with Friends of the Chicago River for Chicago River Day. This year it's coming up on May 8th and volunteers go out and collect trash that uh, regrettably uh, collects on our waterfront and, and different sections of the waterways uh, and uh, improve their ecological health. You can sign up for that at the Friends of the Chicago River website. Uh, the district has also been engaged in, in framing a new strategic plan for the first time the board is doing this in concert with senior staff, but just today we posted the draft strategic plan on our website. We invite you to take a look at it. If you have comments or suggestions, we are open to those. We'll have a public study session uh, for the board to discuss all this on April 15th. And it will be a living document. Each year we'll revisit it but we hope to be ambitious about some uh, efforts to tackle climate change and uh, a range of things like that, to resource recovery, to reuse the treated water. Uh, right now, we, we collectively uh, withdraw close to a billion gallons a day of water from Lake Michigan. It's filtered and treated at the city's treatment plant near Navy Pier and one on the south side and by some of the suburbs, Evanston, Wilmette, Glencoe have their own treatment plants. It's, uh, as Commissioner Degnan said, we use a lot of energy to treat it, to pump it, to filter it, to send it through pipes to our homes and businesses where some of it sits in a wheelbarrow called a toilet, just waiting to convey our human waste to a treatment plant. We use drinkable water for that purpose, which is crazy. And then after we treat it at the treatment plant, we discharge that water into the Chicago waterways. It ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. We don't put it back in Lake Michigan. So reusing treated water for industrial purposes or irrigation is gonna be important in the future. Um, other ways you can uh, be involved as, as Commissioner Degnan talked about composting. Uh, if you can't compost, and, uh, and that's very important to do if you can, but if you can't, and if you have a garbage disposal in your sink, it's actually much better to put food waste down a garbage disposal and send it to a sewage treatment plant where we can capture methane from the anaerobic digesters and use it much more efficiently than if you throw food waste out in the trash where it goes to a landfill. They also capture methane there, but it's a lot less efficient than in a uh, sewage treatment plant. Um, we sell rain barrels at cost, about $45, which is much less than you'll pay at uh, a garden center or home store to, if you live in a house, you can attach it to the downspout of your house, capture that rain, use it to water your plants, wash your car, uh, or uh, even flush your toilet perhaps. Uh, it's perfectly good water delivered free of charge right to your, uh, your home. Um, so, and I would encourage you though, this isn't, uh, helping the district, but except in an oblique way, uh, Commissioner Degnan mentioned the importance of forest preserves and parks for stormwater capture. Well, healthy woodlands, which have been restored, capture and sequester much more stormwater than a degraded woodland. So volunteer a couple of times a year. It's great exercise. You're doing good for nature and it's good for you. I, 
I've done a lot of my volunteer work with a group called the North Branch Restoration Project, but you can go to the Forest Preserve District's website. They list volunteer act opportunities all over uh, Cook County. There's a group called Friends of the Forest Preserves, lots of groups devoted to working in forest preserves and parks throughout the county. Well, that's terrific. Yeah, thinking about all the links there between forest preserves, water, storm water, and then obviously climate change. I'm tempted to go into my lecture, but I'll, I'll spare us all the, 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 the lecture and the quiz, of course. I'll, 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 we won't do that right now. So thank you so much. Um, so for uh, Deputy Director Moskowitz, here's your first question. Uh, what kinds of assistance does the Citizens Utility Board offer for individuals to promote clean energy and safeguard our environment while also avoiding rate, rate hikes and advocating for consumer protection? Yeah, um, well, as I um, already uh, alluded to, we, we help consumers fight high utility bills on a variety of levels. Um, there's only about 25, 26 of us on Cub staff, but we uh, kind of do everything when it comes to utility oversight from working in Springfield, as I mentioned, trying to get better consumer friendly laws passed or preventing consumer unfriendly laws from being passed a lot of the time um, to uh, we have a, a lot of resources available on our website. We update that website every single day. If you ever wanted to know what all those little charges were on your gas bill, for example, we've got a fact sheet about it, but we also have a lot of info now about your options when it comes to energy efficiency and renewables for your home. Um, and we, um, we do events like this. We have a pretty large outreach operation. So we actually have capacity to send folks in better times out into the field. So uh, soon, hopefully we'll all get vaccinated. We'll be back out in the field and you can call us and we'll come speak to your community group or at your church. Or we do these great uh, events that we call utility bill clinics where we bring a bunch of our staff and we invite folks to bring their bills. And we'll look over your bills with you to make sure you're not getting overcharged and maybe find ways that, that you um, you might be able to improve efficiency, get, get tapped into programs that can help you save energy and save money. We're doing those remotely right now. So we do them hosted at scheduled times. Uh, I believe we've done at least one with Com Commissioner Degnan's office. Um, we, uh, we can also, folks can also just email their bills to us if they care to at UBC at citizensutilityboard.org. That's UBC, it stands for Utility Bill Clinic. Um, and we'll just give you a call to talk about what we see on your bills. Unfortunately, sometimes we see folks are overpaying, um, paying more than they need to. And um, because of just the explosion of uh, possibilities for residential customers, folks can now take advantage of programs that um, reward them financially for using less energy at peak times. So there's uh, peak time rebates available through the electric utility. There's also a program called hourly pricing that folks can take advantage of which um, can help you save money. I'm on those programs myself, but it also, if we're able to curb our usage at those high usage electric times, um, we can lessen the need to build more fossil fuel burning power plants. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're not building wind farms to meet our peak needs, we're building natural gas plants and we don't want to have to build more of those. They're expensive and it's also natural gas with all of the, uh, the the related issues there. So um, kind of, uh, we always start where the consumer is at, you know, trying to make sure that uh, they're not getting overcharged, that they can pay their bills, that they have access to the financial assistance that might be available for them, but then also connecting them to those, those resources that can also help them save energy and save money um, and contribute in their own way to lessening um, the need for unsustainable energy practices. So folks can call our hotline if they have questions, um, citizensutilityboard.org, tons of info on there. And also if folks really get riled up and wanna make some changes, we can tell you about some of the legislation that's um, that we're working on right now. I can think of about five bills right now that uh, everything from broadband to clean energy that we're working on right now. So folks should, should feel free to get involved. Yeah, great. I'm sure you, you helped to advocate for some of the um, utility programs like f with the uh, smart thermostats uh, that, you know, those are wonderful because you get it all hooked up and then, yeah, you get the get the alerts and it automatically, you know, changes your setting on your uh, thermostat and you save money. I've, I've gotten like 
I mean, it's five bucks, but like when it happens, you're like, woohoo, this is great. So, so thanks very much. Um, you, you covered some of this, but maybe uh, just to follow up a little bit, what would, you know, for, uh, for your a typical, um, let's, let's just focus on electricity consumption. What would be the biggest drivers for people's bills and what can they do to, 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 to use less? What are some, and I mentioned smart thermostats, so maybe moving on from there. Yeah, for, so for electric bills, of course, everybody's usage is, is different. I live in a pretty small apartment. So if I look at, you know, if you log into your ComEd account online, you can see how much electricity you use each hour of the day. I can see exactly when I use my toaster oven to make lunch. Um, and I can also see when my dishwasher goes, because those are the things that use a lot of electricity in my own home. If I'm looking at somebody's bill uh, and they live in a single family home, say in Chicago, um, or, the, or the adjacent suburbs, and they have really, really high electric usage year round, the first thing I'm probably gonna ask is how many refrigerators do you have? And if you have a left uh, old refrigerator that's out in, your, uh, out in your garage, it's maybe just sitting there chugging away just to cool one six pack, maybe it might be time to say goodbye. Um, my mom, I, actually, I'm, I'm in, out of state right now, I'm visiting a, my mom and, uh, she has a second refrigerator in her basement and it's full of Klond Klondike bars. Like, how many Klondike bars do you need, lady? But anyway, um, I'll, do my, I'll do my share. I'll, I'll try to help her with those. But um, uh, things that heat and cool use a lot of electricity. Um, and that's, so that's air conditioners, that's space heaters. I've seen it all. I saw a really, really high um, winter electric bill. It turns out someone was trying to heat their garage with a space heater. Um, also dehumidifiers, a dehumidifier in your basement that you might've even forgotten about that's set to attain an, uh, an unreasonable level of humidity in your basement. It's just chugging along. That's basically like having a little air conditioner down there. It's compressors running all the time. So those are the big ticket items. Then you're going to want to talk about, you know, um, appliances, TVs, cable boxes, uh, vampire power or phantom load, which is that idea of, um, things that are plugged in in standby mode are still sucking electricity, even though you're not actually using them, in which case perhaps a smart power strip could help with that. Um, there, it, it could kind of be any number of things, and that's why the CUB approach of having a one-on-one -on -one interaction can really be valuable. There's also a program, again, I feel like it's so strange because I, I it, it's still odd for me to be touting things that the utilities are doing as a CUB staffer, but um, they're doing some good stuff because they have to. Um, if you are a, in the city, a People's Gas and a ComEd customer, or in the suburbs, a NICOR Gas and a ComEd customer, it's a joint program offered through the gas and electric utilities, you're entitled to a free home energy assessment. It's not a full home energy audit. It's not with a big blower door test and all that stuff, but it's a very basic assessment. They'll send a professor, uh, professional out to your home, and it'll do a basic walkthrough, see where you might be using a little bit too much energy, and they'll also install a bunch of energy efficiency products in your home for free. So if you have old fashioned incandescent light bulbs, they'll replace them with LEDs, et cetera, et cetera. So folks who haven't taken advantage of that should definitely do it because you've already paid for it in your bills, take advantage of it. And I know we're running short on time, so I'll stop it there. Yeah, great. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Yes, we've done, we've had two houses since we've lived in the area about 13 years and, and definitely we, we took advantage of, of that both times. So thanks so much. Thanks so much. I think since we're getting um, towards the end of our time, I did get, I want to make sure there was a question here I wanted to pose. And I think this would be back to uh, Commissioner Degnan. And it was back when you started talking about the industrial composting and, uh, and it was asking, are there any community gardens run by the county? And if so, do any of them accept community food waste? And yes, I know we, we, we had this just recently at a meeting, so great. Um, well, I mean, the county itself doesn't have a program, but we do have a board seat on something called Neighbor Space. And that's an organization where they uh, promote uh, native, uh, in community gardens. There's a ton of them. You can just go on to the internet and do a Google search for that. Um, but yeah, they some of them accept compost, others do not. It based, it's based on each individual plot, how large it is, if they have enough space for it, and the different types of compost they'll accept. Um, I volunteered at the Metro, Montrose Metro Garden. They compost yard waste, but not food waste. 
Um, so you'd have to check and see, you know, which which garden is closest to you um, and what type of waste they will accept. Now, I think as Commissioner Shore had mentioned earlier about volunteering opportunities, I mean, it's very rare that I, you know, that I feel better than after I am at some sort of volunteering opportunities. Uh, Commissioner Shore had mentioned Friends of the Forest Preserve. You can go to uh, uh, tomorrow. We're posting a, a really fun video with Friends of the Forest Preserves. There's a young man named Derek. He does a lot of work in Labaw Woods, which is in my district at the corner of Cicero and Foster. I mean, we saw out there a number of birds. We saw a muskrat. I mean, there's just, it, you can't tell from the outside, but when you pop in there, there's just like a wonderland of things to see. I know that when I have been there in the middle of the winter doing um, a winter work day, we were clearing out the buckthorn, creating a giant pile. I mean, literally the pile was probably 14 feet high and it was just burning all the invasive species and clearing out the undergrowth to allow the ferns and plants to come up that, are, that should have been there naturally occurring. Um, I'm returning that forest preserve to the way that it is, has its best and highest use. Um, so I really just, you know, I know we're winding down. So I'd really just encourage people to go online. You can really just Google, how can I be more eco-friendly? I mean, uh, one of my favorite things to say is naked produce, not all the carrots and all the celery and everything does not have to be wrapped in plastic. And every time you see one of those pull down things of plastic, you don't have to use them just because they're there. There's like, you can go home, you can wash and rinse off your lettuce. Our stomachs can handle a lot. There's little bits of dirt that we eat. We're human, it's gonna be okay. Um, but I, you know, my grandma used to say, you'd eat a peck of dirt before you die. And I didn't realize until I was a lot older that a peck is a barrel. So <laughs> I just think that as we've gone on, we like to be clean and germ-free and Corona, that's super useful. But I really think that there's so many things that we can do in our day-to-day -day life. We all love, you know, nice clothes, but you can get really nice clothes from going to a, a thrift shop. There's a lot of cool stuff there and it's, you know, you're reusing the clothes, you send them to the, you know, you can put them through the sanitary um, wash cycle. And if you've got, a, you know, kids, all their summer clothes, they're gonna grow out of them next year anyway. So you may as well just spend a dollar on a pair of shorts that somebody else wore for a year rather than go to the Gap or Target and go buy a new pair that is going to be, you know, harming the environment. There's just a lot of different ways that we can be supportive. And I really encourage you just to go out and go look at some tips and incorporate them into your life because you really will feel better. I promise. Well, great. That's, uh, that's terrific. Uh, Thanks very much there. Uh, I think so, com uh, Commissioner Degnan, I'm gonna hand it back to you. I think we're at the, um, I'm looking at the time here. We're at the end of our hour. I just wanna uh, th you know, certainly thank the the three panelists. This was terrific. I learned a lot. I've been, you know, I've, I've, I've yes, I've done the water story for many years, but I, you know, I heard new things and, and, and from all, all three panelists learned, learned a lot. And this was, this was great. This was terrific. And I will use it in all my classes now. So that will be, uh, that will be very nice. But Commissioner Degnan, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Mark. And you are a great moderator. I love the extra little, you know, step of organically, haha, you know, getting from one panelist to the next. You did a great job. Um, so you're hired on the next one of these that we have. I really want to thank everybody for being here tonight, everybody that's watching on Facebook Live, and everybody that will watch this after tonight. It will be on my website, commissionerdegnan.com. Um, I really encourage you to follow Cobb, um, Deborah Shore, and myself on social media, because that's really the best way that we have to get out the message for the different organizations that we work with and for. Um, we have a lot of great interactive content. We a lot of time and care on that content so we hope that you find it to be super interesting um you know if you have questions for us after tonight you can free, feel free to give us a call or to email us um i really just want to highlight that this month um you know my office and i are doing this earth month um panel series tonight is what you can do for the environment. Um, we are next having what government is doing for the environment on Earth Day, and that's Thursday, April 27th at 6 p.m. And our last part of the series is what businesses can do for the environment, and that will be on Thursday, April 29th at 6 p.m. as well. So 
So um, everybody have a great night. It was great to see you, uh, everyone. And thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye. It was great. Bye.